So if I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, all of my training for control systems has been towards non-linear controls. So to make this video, I've actually been watching a lot of YouTube videos on the Nyquist Criterion, reading textbooks such as Sontag's Mathematical Control Theory, and also I've been reviewing a lot of my complex analysis and trying to piece and paste all these together so I can make this video for you guys. So it's actually a very clever bit of complex analysis and tied in with Laplace transforms and control theory, and I'm really excited to share this with you. So let's go ahead and talk about stability. So today the big question is, what is stability? Now if you take a look at a general nonlinear dynamical system, such as nonlinear systems by Khalil, you will find that there's a good five or six standard notions of what stability is. But for linear systems, we are going to be concerned with, say, three. Specifically, we care about bounded input, bounded output stability which means that if we have it, an input signal into our system that is bounded, then the output should also be bounded. Now, similarly, if we have a signal that is L2, we would also like to know if we get an L2 signal out of it. And if this happens, then we say our system is L2 stable. And finally, the best kind of stability that we would like is exponential stability, which means that we go to zero exponentially fast. And for this, we can just look at the poles of our system and we can also use the Nyquist criterion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you how we can use our system's response to an impulse and in fact, that Laplace transform, which gives us our transfer function. And we're going to use that transfer function in order to characterize these three different notions of stability. So we're going to use the Paley-Wiener theorem that we just proved in the past two videos. We're also going to use a bit of complex analysis. And before we wrap everything up, I want to talk to you about a slightly misleading statement in Sontag's mathematical control theory. So Biba stability is probably the easiest one for me to explain to you. Essentially, if you remember all of our statements about the Laplace transform, we defined it in terms of an integral. Now, if we have, say, an exponential function e to the at, we know that this integral turns into 1 over s minus a. And usually when we talk about the Laplace transform of these functions, we think of this as being a function over the entire complex plane, maybe ignoring that a part. Now, we only have agreement between that rational function and the integral representation of our Laplace transform when the real part of s is bigger than a. And we say that this is the region of convergence of that integral. If you want to verify Biebo stability, then you take a look at the transfer function, and the transfer function is the Laplace transform of the impulse response function. If the region of convergence of the integral representation of the Laplace transform of the impulse response function includes the imaginary axis, then we say that your system is going to be Bebo stable. So now that is one kind of stability down, but what about L2 stability? Now for this, we can actually use the Paley-Wiener theorem, which we just spent two videos going over. In particular, what we see is that if we take an L2 signal as our input, then the Laplace transform of this input is going to be a function that is analytic in the right half of the complex plane. And it also satisfies certain L2 conditions along vertical lines in the right half of the complex plane. Now, if I were to take an analytic function that is bounded on the right half of the complex plane, and I multiply it by that other Laplace transform, then what I'll have is another Laplace transform that is analytic in the right half plane, and also satisfies those same L2 conditions. But that is also the Laplace transform of our output. And the Paley-Wiener theorem says that if we have that kind of analytic function, then the signal that gave us that analytic function through the Laplace transform must itself be L2. That is, if we have a transfer function that is a bounded analytic function on the right half of the complex plane, then we know that our system is going to be L2 stable. So now that has two stability notions down, and what we'd like is we'd like to also find conditions to get exponential stability. Now, this is actually relatively easy conceptually to demonstrate. And in fact, all we really need is that all the poles of our transfer function be on the left half of the complex plane. If you think about that term one over s minus a, we know that corresponds to an exponential function e to the at. If a is say positive, then we have an exponentially growing term. And if a is negative, then we have an exponentially decaying term. And well, that puts a zero on either the left or the right half of the complex plane. So if we take a look at our transfer function and say it's a rational transfer function, what we're going to see is that if we take a look at the denominator and look at its poles, we can determine if that system is going to be exponentially stable or unstable, depending on where they all reside. However, factoring that denominator is fairly difficult. 
And this might even be more complicated if you have a transfer function that isn't rational. Nyquist at Bell Laboratories determined a neat little trick that you can do with complex analysis in order to figure out if you have any poles on the right half of the complex plane. Now, this involves wrapping a contour around the entire complex plane and also using some notions from well, some basic complex analysis. All right, so now before we get into the meat of the video, which is really about the complex analysis that surrounds the Nenet Quiz Criterion, I wanna take a second and ask you to go ahead and hit the like button if you like what you've seen so far. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment below. I try to keep track of these for the next several months after a video is released. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get back to it. So it looks like we're gonna be looking at this thing again. And this is John Conway's functions of one complex variable. So now if you have a meromorphic function that has a pole at a point, you have a simple contour that goes around that pole exactly once and you integrate it along it, then the result is going to be 2 pi i. And so if we divide by 2 pi i, we end up getting 1. Now what we're going to look at is called the argument principle. And if we take a look at the zeros and the poles of a meromorphic function, and we'll call these zeros z1 through zn and the poles p1 through pm, and we take a contour that surrounds all of them, and we integrate the function f prime divided by f along that contour, then the result that we're going to end up getting is the number of zeros minus the number of poles. And in other words, n minus m. So now this is actually really easy to see. If we have a function f and it has a zero of order, say, k at a point a, then we can rewrite that function, say, f as z minus a to the k times g of z, where g doesn't have a zero at a. So now if we take a look at the function f prime over f, what we can use is the product rule. So then we can see that we can actually separate this out as a sum of one over z minus z i where i runs through all of our zeros and also including multiplicity. And we subtract the sum of one over z minus pi, where i runs through one up to m. We repeat the poles up to multiplicity as well. And then we get this other term that just involves g prime over g. If we have a function that doesn't have any poles in a closed contour, then we know this integral is gonna be zero. And g prime over g, by definition, doesn't have any poles so that integral around the contour is zero. Now for each one of those rational functions that corresponds to our zeros, we're gonna get a contribution of one. And for all the ones that correspond to our poles, we get negative one. And so we see that the ultimate result of an integral along a contour that surrounds these zeros and the poles, and also where we divide by two pi i, we ultimately get the number of zeros minus the number of poles. So now what we are concerned with is whether or not we have any poles in the right half of the complex plane. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to make a contour that surrounds them. Generally thinking the idea is that we're making a contour that surrounds the entire right half of the complex plane, but that's not really going to be something that's feasible to do. So really what we're going to do is we're going to have a contour that is very, very large that travels up and down the imaginary axis, but stops at some point on the imaginary axis and then does one large semicircle around it. As the length along the imaginary axis goes to infinity, we should eventually encompass all of our poles and zeros. Intuitively, we would say that this is ultimately going to be surrounding the right half of the complex plane. And that's exactly what Sontag says is mathematical control theory. Although that's a little bit misleading because if you do just think of having your contour really just going up and down the imaginary axis, you can actually think of it in terms of the Riemann sphere, where that whole semicircular bit just converges to the infinity point on the sphere. Unfortunately though, once you're at that point of convergence, you don't really know if you're surrounding the right half or the left half of the complex plane. And you'd get very different results depending on which one you look at. So while it's a nice notion to think that we're actually wrapping around the entire right half of the complex plane, it's not actually what we're doing. So here's the idea. So if you take a look at that integral that we've been talking about, the one that gives you the difference between the zeros and the poles, what we can do is we can actually use the change of variables and we can set w is equal to f of z. And so then when we make this change of variables, the contour changes from being just the contour we had before to our function applied to the contour. And now there's only one pole to worry about inside the integral and that is the pole at zero. What this really boils down to 
is how many times the image of that contour wraps around the origin. And so we don't even have to take the integral at all. So if we take a contour and then we map it to the other side, we can actually just look at how many times that contour is wrapped around zero. And so what I'm gonna do, and this is typically what's done, is instead of thinking of this in terms of a counterclockwise travel along the contour, we're gonna think of it in terms of a clockwise travel around the contour. And that's just gonna swap all of our results by putting a minus sign. But this is convention, and this is what is done with Nyquist diagrams and things like that. We see that if we are traveling in a clockwise orientation around a pole, it's, we're gonna have a counterclockwise mapping of our contour that loops around zero. And if we have a zero inside of our curve, then it goes clockwise. If we have a pole and a zero, we don't encircle the origin at all. And if we have, say, a zero and two poles, well, we're only gonna loop around it once. But if we have three poles and one zero, then we'll wrap around it twice, counterclockwise. So it is this idea that we're gonna be using to develop the Nyquist criterion. So here's the Nyquist problem. We have an open loop connection between a plant G and say a controller H, and say they're connected serially. That gives us the transfer function G times H. And we expect to know a good deal about G and H. And so we expect to know where those poles are. Now. What we would like to know is whether or not the closed loop system, when I loop that back around, if that is gonna actually be stable. And we wanna use information from the open loop case to help us in the closed loop case. So we know the poles for the open loop connections, but we don't know the poles for the closed loop. And the closed loop transfer function equals g divided by one plus gh, where we are having a negative feedback. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to determine the poles of that system. And that means that we're looking for the zeros of one plus g times h. Now we know the poles of g times h, and so we can use that in order to isolate the zeros of one plus g times h. So if we apply our one plus g times h to our Nyquist contour, we can see how many times we encircle the origin. And then what we can do is we can use the number of poles that we know that comes from g times h, and then that will tell us exactly how many zeros we end up having. And then those zeros are the poles of our system, and if we know if there are any zeros, that is gonna be unstable, and that's the Nyquist criterion. Now, there is one slight modification that is usually done, and in that case, we're really just gonna be shifting it by one. And so we're gonna be looking at encirclements of not zero, but negative one. And the reason why we do this is because we already have g times h as our open loop transfer function, and there's really no harm in just shifting it around. So that is the Nyquist criterion, and this is one of the major tools in linear systems theory. Now, Nyquist has done a lot of really great work. So if you wanna see how we can connect Paley Wiener's work on entire functions and Fourier transforms with the Nyquist sampling theorem, then check out this video here. And until I see you next time, I hope you have a great day.